Welcome to Middlesex University London and the final broadcasting talk in our series. We've decided to change the format slightly and instead of me asking the questions, we've got two students asking me about my career in broadcasting. Hello and welcome to the sixth and last episode of Broadcasting Today Media and Transformation um, introduced by the media department here at Middlesex University. My name is Georgiana Tudor and together with my colleague Philip Sandman, we have the great pleasure of having Kurt Barling as a guest today. As some of you may know, Kurt has been chairing um, the previous editions of Broadcasting Today which featured prestigious journalists such as Martin Bell, Guardian's Hugh Muir, Five Lives Dot in Adebayo and BBC's Sean Kevill and Mary Hockaday. Although all the previous guests have come from different uh, backgrounds, they all agreed on one aspect. Journalism is changing and for today's students, there's a um, whole different uh, skill set required to succeed. Although the technological advancements are determining the business model to change rapidly and there is more and more emphasis on teaching media ethics, journalism is still a profession for the fast, the curious, and certainly not for the faint-hearted. And that's precisely what we'll be talking about today with Kurt. Kurt began his career as a lecturer at the London School of Economics. In 1989, he decided to join the BBC. And at a very young age, he actually covered the fall of the Berlin Wall in his first document, one of his first documentaries. Since documentaries became Kurt's area of expertise, I think we can say, Amongst many other things, he shot a documentary on how the UN could ensure children's rights, uh, taking him to Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the US. Kurt has always observed and scrutinized leadership. He made films about politics in France, Panama, and Yugoslavia. He has a great interest in the economy, and he has produced a range of films on business matters in the UK and Europe uh, during his time at the Money Program. Kurt is also a very versatile journalist. Not only has he produced great television, he has also produced and reported for Radio 5 Live and Radio 4. Um, he was part of the long-running uh, series Money Box. He shot several documentaries that were part of BBC's Black Britain. And Kurt has also won several awards. Uh, his first one in 1997, making him the Reporter of the Year appointed by the Commission for Racial Equality. Since 2001, he is the special correspondent for the BBC in London. This guy sounds interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but um, let's start with the beginning. You started as a lecturer at the London School of Economics um, in international relations. Now, that's a very unusual path to take. Normally, people would, um, would go to journalism practice, and then they will become academics later in their life. Um, as the common route is the other way around, what sort of skills and experience would you say you've gathered throughout your years as an academic and brought with you in your journalism practice? Oh, that's easy. The most important thing for me as a young man was to learn how to think, uh, to learn how to challenge myself, uh, how to challenge others, challenge those in power. Uh, some people would describe me as a bit of a subversive journalist, that is somebody who's always wanting to challenge accepted concepts, accepted norms. Uh, just because we see things in a certain way doesn't mean that I thought when I was a young academic we should be teaching people to see things in those ways. No, we should be teaching people to challenge the way we see things. I mean, there could be no better example than that, working in an environment where we've seen a digital revolution over 10 years, where virtually nothing we do now replicates what I did when I began as a journalist. And the training I got at the London School of e Economics was really important for that. It taught me real intellectual forensic skills, how to break things down, how to de deconstruct ideas, how to deconstruct arguments. And it's very easy when you become a journalist to be sitting opposite somebody who's in power, who wants to tell you one story, for you to just go along with that story and sit within their paradigm. The important thing about my early training was that it taught me never to take things at face value 
and to always, in the midst of an engagement with somebody in power, to try and deconstruct what they were telling you. And very often you find those people are deeply uncomfortable with that. So the second thing that the LSE taught me was to have confidence in your ideas, because if you don't have confidence in your ideas, you will soon get tripped up by people who are more confident than you. And believe it or not, those people who govern tend to be very confident. I was once asked when I came into the BBC very early on, um, I'd gone off and I'd been given some money to go and make a, a four-part series, five-part series for BBC Five Live on the changing nature of the workplace. And I interviewed a lot of interesting people. We made some interesting programmes which went out on Five Live. And then the head of that particular department, who shall remain nameless, said to me, Kurt, you did some great work, but the one thing that worries me is your relationship with people within the BBC, because you don't seem to want to play the politics of the game here. And I said, it seems to me what you're saying is you don't want me to be challenging people. You want me to be a shrinking violet. And I said, there's no place in my space for shrinking violets. And the LSE and that er early education, particularly the PhD studies and having to take responsibility for instructing students, gave me that ability not to be a shrinking violet. I, you probably could ask my mother and she said, well, you know, that's rubbish because he was like that when he was five years of age. Let's actually go back to an old story and one that changed the world. In, in, uh, in 1989, when the Berlin Wall fell, you were actually standing with one foot on the east side of the country and, and one foot on the west side of the country and um, I would say probably not a lot of journalists have ever had the chance to to cover such a historical, uh, sorry, historically significant moment. Uh, what did you feel during this moment and how were you able to really capture the mood of the united people? In the Germany? first thing when I was standing there with one foot in the east and one foot in the west was the number of people coming back uh, past me with oranges. Mm. And I was like, these people have been waiting for freedom for you know, since the end of the Second War, certainly since the end of 61, and they're all coming past me with oranges. Because, of course, they've been given their D mark, and the thing they could get most was, you know, and take back was oranges. I think they'd stuffed their faces with, um, you know, cream cake and whatever on the Kafursendam. <laughs> but, you know, I was struck by the simplicity of that. Um, that actually it was a simple thing, that actually people wanted. Freedom is a very simple thing at the end of the day. Um, the other thing that struck me was that. I was born, ironically, in 1961 when the wall was built. Uh, my father is German, so within my family it had become an accepted norm that the wall would never go. It would always be there. It was a division that was permanent. Um, and from there flowed that the Cold War was permanent. And on that particular day, for me, was a, it was a slightly surreal moment but you recognise in that moment that the world had changed. And actually, as a journalist, uh, just two weeks old as a journalist, I was right at the heart of being able to mediate that story. For an audience, I think the film got something like four and a half million, which is, you know, not a bad audience. We wouldn't get that now, but uh, nevertheless, you know, it's a four and a half million audience who shared that moment and shared the extraordinary s feeling of liberation um, of creativity that the breach in the wall uh, created. I mean, <laughs> it's funny, back then, I said to myself, and lots of other people said to me, you'll probably never have another experience in your whole career which is as dramatic and groundbreaking as this. I'm yet to find another one like that. Uh, but it, it taught me a very important thing. You should never accept norms. Everything is possible. If we wind the clock back 12 hours before I had my feet on either side of the wall, I'd arrived in the west and I'd come through, through Checkpoint Charlie into the east. I'd come to the uh, Grand Hotel, got the last room available because every journalist in Christendom had landed in East Berlin. And virtually every BBC journalist of any note, including Martin Bell, was there on that night. I decided to take a walk out of the hotel and I walked up the road and I could hear this music, um, Glenn Miller's In The Mood, being played on a saxophone. I thought, wow, that's incredible. I'm in here in East Berlin and somebody's playing jazz music on tonight of all nights. 
and I walked and I was trying to find out where this music was coming from and I looked down off Französische Straße and I saw a, 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 a silhouette of somebody on the Berlin Wall playing the saxophone. <laughs> Glenn Miller's in the mood and I'm, you crazy, you're going to get shot. You know, you, don't, you know you can die doing that. And at that moment, of course, I realised that he wasn't going to die and the world had changed. In 2001, the world changed as well. That was when you started <laughs> for the BBC as the special correspondent. But of course, it was also uh, the year when the terrorist attacks happened uh, in, in America. How, um, how has your role evolved over time, the, the, the BBC special correspondency? Well, look, you know, that was, a, as you say, quite rightly, a very big uh, moment. And strangely enough, uh, on September the 8th, uh, 2001, um, I was on a flight, on American Airlines flight, coming back from uh, New York. Uh, and so when that, those planes went into that, that, that building, I really felt it. My kids, who at that point were much younger, saw it and made the link that we were on the plane, the same airline, coming back to London, you know, could have been us kind of thing. And so for them, it was a very uh, personal and poignant moment. In terms of covering the story of terrorism, it of course, up until then, it was a very moot point of whether the terrorism that other people and other countries had seen would ever land on Western soil. Of course, the French knew it could happen because of the, French, the bombings in uh, Paris on the metro in 1995. And in fact, as it happens, I was in the middle of making a film for Channel 4, Dispatches, called, which we called Trouble at the Mosque. Uh, and we'd done a, a, a fine cut uh, in September. In fact, in August, I went away on holiday, came back. The fine cut was ready to broadcast. And it was a very problematic broadcast at that moment because what it was doing was looking at the likes of Abu Hamza and saying, this man is up to no good in Finsbury Park Mosque. And at that point, we were challenging the accepted norms and the way of looking at this particular story, and uh, the broadcasters were profoundly uncomfortable with it because they felt it may be Islamophobic or it might at least be perceived as Islamophobic. So uh, the program effectively got pulled uh, for its transmission date in November, and it eventually got broadcast the following year in February or March. It was a seminal piece of work because we had observed a lot of mischief going on in Britain's mosques and particularly in the mosque where Abu Hamza was and we'd been undercover and we'd seen some of those people who were busy orchestrating mayhem. We didn't know precisely where and when it would happen but we knew it would happen in the United Kingdom. So actually, it didn't take us as journalists very much by surprise when it happened in the United States. Um, and we were able to put that in some kind of context. Of course, as a correspondent in London, people responded to uh, what happened in New York, recognizing that it could happen here. Um, I set about doing a lot of films at the time about um, the links between uh, those who were being radicalized uh, and those people who were recognized to have been involved in those bombings. And interestingly, it kind of changed two things. It changed the debate about whether it could happen here, everyone accepted it could, and it changed the debate within the Muslim community about what their role in this society was. And Interestingly, I had a lot of experience back in the late 1980s and early 1990s looking at the response of the black community to the questions of uh, being pushed on the outside because of the riots that had happened in the beginning uh, of the 80s and suddenly the coming of age of that community recognizing that they had to engage with that debate, had to uh, not be directed by others, they had to help direct that debate and, and bridge the gap between two communities who were tr having trouble engaging with each other over a very sensitive issue. Suddenly, the Muslim community found itself, or communities of Britain found themselves in a similar situation. And we found ourselves as journalists able to broker or arbitrate in that conversation. In fact, the irony of Channel 4 being reluctant to 
broadcast immediately in the wake of the 9-11 bombings was the number of Muslims who'd been involved in this story saying, you've got to get this story out. This is a story of, uh, from our perspective about the issues that our community faces and we need this story to be heard. And I think as a consequence, not just of that film of course, but a consequence of the debate around 9-11, suddenly the Muslim communities of Britain also came of age. They started to challenge the accepted norms. Was it right that people like Abu Hamza should be allowed to operate in the mosque environment with impunity? Um, should they have special privileges because they were in uh, that environment? The mosque environment was not regulated because it's not like the Catholic Church. Each mosque and each imam is sovereign. Was that the right way for us to conduct our business? Muslim community activists asked themselves. And we were able to mediate those conversations. So 2001, 9-11 had dramatic implications for the way in which we covered the story and the way in which the communities most affected by the perceptions coming out of that story were able to... Uh, uh, involve themselves in the debate. Thinking um, in a bit more detail on terrorism and your investigative film, um, can you tell us a little bit about the potential dangers involved um, in, in that and um, a possible decline of investigative journalism and, and reasons behind that? Well, the most difficult thing with investigating terrorism is the prospect of death. <laughs> uh, because, of course, if you ruffle the wrong feathers, people can come and get you. Uh, and that's not just uh, in terrorism here, uh, that's in all sorts of filming that I've done in my career where actually you um, challenge people who don't play by the rules. I don't mean politicians, I mean people who work underground very often and if you threaten their um, ability to do their job as they see it, they can threaten you with um, a, a less permanent existence. Now, to detense the atmosphere a little bit, <laughs> I'm going to um, ask you to talk a bit about radio. Yeah. I know you've worked for BBC Radio 4 and 5 Live, um, although you're mostly a television journalist. But um, there is a tendency that um, most journalists will have had radio or newspaper experience somewhere along the line. Would you say that that's something which is very useful, even if your focus is television? And, and why do you think that experience is important in radio or newspaper? Well, two things. First, as a point of access, television has a narrow spectrum and fewer opportunities. Radio has a massive spectrum and masses of opportunities. If you want to find a point of access into broadcasting, logic tells you you need to start somewhere where there is more opportunity. Radio and print are good places to seek out that opportunity. Actually, when you become a performer, um, or whether you become a producer, radio has a great canvas. You know, really, you want a, any canvas you can to paint on. Uh, television is an exciting one because there are bright lights and you can tell fantastic stories. It's a particular medium uh, which has uh, a particular attraction for some people. But some people much rather work with voice and words. They don't want to be seen on screen. Wouldn't be seen dead on screen, frankly. But radio offers them that opportunity to project uh, a story to an audience um, which is more sympathetic to that medium. Um, and actually, it's great performing on, um, on radio. You, we interviewed Dotton Adebayo, didn't we? And Dotton is a radio man. But I love going on his program because I don't have to be as constrained on radio as I am on television. It's more of a conversation. The art of it is much freer. And I think you know, you'd be a fool just to concentrate on one uh, particular medium um, to tell stories and engage with the public uh, because radio is a great way of doing it. And actually, it's much more akin to uh, writing, newspaper writing, radio, uh, because it's you and the word. I used to love doing from our own correspondent because it was me with words and an audience. Um, I didn't have to wear a tie or worry about the way I looked. Um, and it was, it was, you felt much freer to express yourself. The average television script is about that big. The average radio script is about that big. That means a lot more words uh, to convey your thoughts. It's uh, much easier to shape an argument. You're not constricted often by um, the, uh, the material that you gather from people because you're freer to um, interpret and present that material 
uh, because it's a more fluid uh, medium. I think it's fair to say that some of your most appreciated work was done during the Black Britain series. Mm -hmm. um, do you think you were given so much credit and responsibility during uh, Black Britain because you were black, because you were a very ethical journalist or a mixture of both? And if so, what is there that journalists need to make sure they always do in order to report um, immigration and race in a fair manner? Look, you know, when, when, when the idea of Black Britain first came up, uh, the BBC approached me and I said, hmm, I've worked very hard to make sure that I'm not seen as a black journalist. I am a journalist, first and foremost, in this professional space. Of course, I'm part of Britain's black communities, but what I bring to the table is a level of professionalism. And so I was slightly anxious that somehow that sense of professionalism would be compromised. Fortunately, we had a very good team of young journalists there, um, including myself, who was reasonably young at that point. And we, I think, all had, sh had a shared ambition that we could show people that you could be professional and you could come up with stories which weren't only relevant to black communities, it was also relevant to the broader community. Now, you've got to remember the timing of Black Britain was in the wake of Stephen Lawrence murder. Of course, today is the 20th anniversary of that murder. Uh, many people in uh, Britain's black communities felt they'd been unheard. They had no um, voice. They had no voice in the broadcast broadcasting spectrum, apart from somewhere on, you know, sat late Saturday night or early Sunday morning um, on some local radio station, which didn't get a lot of exposure. So BBC Two saying, we're going to have a, pro a program um, called Black Britain, which is identifying its, its target audience as those members of the black communities of Britain, was, you know, <laughs> for what it's worth, it was quite groundbreaking. Of course, there were lots of people who wrote in and said, well, there's no programme called White Britain, so why is there a programme called Black Britain? But I think, actually, we did some really interesting work. I need to get myself killed, actually, doing that programme in Africa, but that's by the by. Um, but the Black Britain message was one that this voice must be heard, this voice must somehow be integrated into mainstream um, BBC output. I think it was. Uh, and that's not necessarily the reason that Black Britain didn't carry on before, b beyond its third or fourth series, but I think it's because a lot of the issues that it raised, the Stephen Lawrence case helped that cause, meant that those communities' voices could be much more easily heard within the mainstream outlets. And I think that's true today. And I certainly will take some credit for that as a member of a team of journalists who stuck their necks out and said, OK, we can tell this story more efficiently, more effectively. We can offer the audience more insight because of where we've come from. So we'll put aside the idea that perhaps we were recruited because we're black. We were recruited because we're a professional and we bring something extra to the table. Because we come from those communities, we offer greater insight and will be of greater public service. Kurt, you know that... Uh Every guest that has appeared on, on broadcasting today has to answer one question that you've asked, and Rajana and myself have asked the same question. Now we want to ask it to you. What personal advice can you give for young aspiring journalists, for all those people in the audience, and for many more that will watch, hopefully watch this show? Look, you know, the most important thing about being a journalist is really wanting to hear other people's stories and wanting to be truthful in mediating those stories. So you've got to become a storyteller. You've got to be enthusiastic about other people's stories. Lots of people think going on television is about ego, mostly your ego. Actually, going on television is a huge privilege. Going on the radio is a huge privilege. Being a journalist in any media is a huge privilege because you get to poke your nose in other people's business. But do it for a reason. And I think if you have that enthusiasm and commitment to tell other people's stories. They're not always tough stories. Sometimes they're history stories or music stories, but tell the stories um, uh, properly um, and efficiently. I think if you can do that, uh, you've got the right starting material. Of course, and it's, it's a very good way of, I think, of if you've made a choice at 18 that you want to become a journalist 
and you come on a course like the one here at Middlesex University, I think you can, um, you need to throw yourself into it. You need to recognise this is not a field for shrinking violets. It's a field where you need to have flexible skills and you need to constantly maintain an open mind about those, the flexibility you need for those skills, because one day you might need to be working on film, suddenly film disappears, you're working on tape, suddenly tape disappears and you're working on digital cards. You know, so you need to be flexible enough to not get um, flummoxed by the technology. Uh, but there's a lot of opportunity out there. In fact, I would argue there's more opportunity now for points of access than there were in 1989. Um, because there are so many more platforms on which you can operate. The great difficulty will be that after five years, the jobs won't be there that people moved into after their first point of access 20 years ago. By the same token, people who are imaginative will be able to create their own space. They will be able to, you know, Sean Kevill said it, you will be able to create your own space on the, on the digital platform. Uh, Dotton Adebayo said it, there's more place for you to articulate your, your voice in, you know, in all sorts of areas in, in radio terms. Hugh Muir has said it, there's more places for you to, to, um, um, to, to write and articulate your voice and find your voice as a writer or a performer or as a practitioner. Um, I seem to remember Martin Bell said, you're the future, Philip, uh, and that I'm the present and he was the past. Well, you know, I think you've got to be a combination of all three of those things, the past, the present and the future as a young aspiring journalist, recognising the great heritage that there is, uh, recognising that you've got to learn the skills and be on top of your game now because if you can do that, you will be somebody who can perform and continue to perform sustainably, uh, you know, for 20, 30 years. It's not an easy profession to go in. If you want an easy job with lots of money, go and be a banker or a lawyer, you know. That's the, that's the truth of the matter. If you want a job which has got an amazing amount of fun, I, I once made a film on President Mitterrand, um, back uh, when he had the 10th anniversary of his uh, accession to power in 81. So we made the film in 1991. And I can remember being under a bridge with some down and outs, a guy who was with his son, who'd had a professional life, had, you know, fallen on hard times and was now was going to a place where he was getting handouts. Um, and he was a very proud man with his son there. And I, I wished him good luck. And he said to me, where are you going now? I said, I'm going off to see President Mitterrand. Anything you want me to tell him? And uh, he looked at me as if to say, are you serious? And uh, he said, well, just tell him that, you know, it's, these are hard times. The president needs to know that it's tough here, you know? It's, it's, it hurts me having to come here with my son and do this, get handouts. I wasn't built for that. So we duly went off to the Elysee Paris and uh, we went into the Elysee Palace and a man with a great big medallion uh, came through the door and said, Monsieur, Madame, le Président de la République. And in came this little man, about five foot four. And uh, we sat down and we interviewed him. We told him there was a man on the street under the, under the arches of a bridge. And we said that he's fallen on hard time. Do you recognize that poverty is real in France? Uh, Mitterrand, as was Mitterrand's way, didn't answer the question. Um, but nevertheless, we made the point. And for me, that experience is a an experience you want to convey to students. What other walk of life could you be with a man of such dignity, and another man, many people would say, of such dignity, but at different ends of the spectrum, within two hours? It's, you know, it's, it's a great uh, privilege to practice as a journalist. It's a very exciting <coughs> field to be in, uh, and one probably without compare. You know, you wouldn't imagine the number of really wealthy friends I've got after 25 years who own, you know, big houses and they've got, you know, Bugattis and all the rest of it and say, God, you know, we'd really love to do what you do sometimes, you know. Uh, and I obviously make the obvious point, <laughs> well, only if you can prepare to live on a little meagre salary. Uh, <laughs> but they uh, genuinely see our job as cutting edge, you know, really exciting because it's so different. You know, no two days are the same. You started talking about um, your early years as an academic um, and I would like to conclude on that note and ask you 
why are you here? <laughs> why do you think Middlesex University needs a professor for professional practice? In a time of budget cuts, as there have been shortages in many of its departments and, and facilities, um, why is it important uh, to have you here as a professor for professional practice? Of course, I'm the wrong person to ask that question of, but I'll attempt to mm -hmm. do so. Um, I, I think the idea behind professional practice professors is to encourage universities in, in an environment where students are investing not just their time, but a lot of their money because they are taking on huge debts to get uh, a degree. I think the universities have to recognise that they must be sure to focus students' minds and the staff's minds on the real prize. And the real prize is not just getting a piece of paper at the end of three years, it's having a certain uh, professional engagement by the time you get to the end of those three years. The prize is the future of work. We must prepare students for the workplace. That doesn't mean you do away with the classics and all those other kind of traditional uh, Russell Group uh, qualifications, but if you are offering students a pathway to work, you must make sure that you are genuinely making that happen. Professional practice should introduce the outside world into the university, and hopefully it will take the people within the university into the outside world. And that um, combination, I think, will prepare young people better for a life of work than just by having people talking at them in lecture halls. You know, I spent the best part of five years being talked at by lecturers, and sometimes it's very stimulating, but many times I could find myself nodding off. And I think if you can engage students, give them some ownership. Look, here we are sitting on a stage in a TV studio. You have taken ownership of broadcasting today, this talk. That has prepared you as well for anything you're likely to do as any lecture that you've done. That has to be the model of making sure that the intellectually challenging work that you do, writing essays and engaging with other students, peer group and seminars, must be balanced out with the reality of what it's like. Don't imagine what it's like, do it. And by doing that, you get a better balance, hopefully, uh, professional practice elsewhere in the university as well as here in media can help uh, mediate that balance and if we do it well we will have an enhanced reputation for delivering on what students need so when students leave Middlesex University London they won't say what on earth did I spend 50,000 pound on they will say that was a good investment that money which I'm gonna have to pay back perhaps over 10 or 15 years, was a good investment because it gave me the best preparation for life. I think I speak for everyone in saying that you've given <coughs> us a, a brilliant insight into, into how it's like to have a long-standing successful career, but also the challenges that that um, entails. And because it's rather impossible to cover um, so many things in just one hour, I'm sure the audience might have some questions uh, that they would like to ask you about things that we haven't perhaps talked about? So, audience, please. I've been wondering, uh, with this, this notion of the media at the fourth, as the fourth estate. Now, we've got biggest estates and um, power of the world. When G8 is meeting, do we have an equivalent G8 media? Now, when BBC, is saying something about Syria. Do people in this at Syria in Syria or the UN take it as BBC speaking or Britain speaking? When will journalists speak? When we are condemning America, is it Britain condemning America? Is it Russia? Is it Africa? Where are the voices of powerful journalists? You think there's an absence of powerful journalist <coughs> voices? Is that what you're getting at? There might be, but our voices are transmitted through established media companies. Well, one would argue, uh, I know Philip would certainly argue this, maybe he's even arguing it in his dissertation, that the new broadcasting, digital broadcasting spectrum is a challenge to the orthodoxy. 
And yes, you're right that uh, the BBC, ITV, even Sky are, are institutionally based and they have certain ways of doing things. Uh, but the new broadcasting spectrum, whether it be uh, through uh, internet blogs, I mean, there are plenty of challenges to that. I don't think that necessarily is making a difference right now, but it, I believe it will make a difference over time. That those challenges, they're already influencing. Mary Hockaday sat here and said, we are monitoring those outputs in order that we can be sure that what we're doing is the right kind of journalism, you know, the most reflective journalism that we can do, reflecting a broad spectrum of ideas. Will the BBC ever... Um, be able to disassociate itself from the state. Um, not in everyone's eyes it won't be able to. There will always be those people who think that the, the BBC is an organ of the British state. Actually, after 25 years, I'm happy to report that not once have I been asked to withdraw something I wanted to broadcast. Not once have I been put under pressure to say something I didn't want to say. So actually, it's pretty, as a broadcaster, it's a pretty <coughs> fair a broadcaster. Is the BBC fair on reporting Syria? Well, Mary Hockaday again sat here and said, you know, we do our best in difficult circumstances because we can't get the access we would like for our own journalists, so we do use other journalists and other people who are there operating on the ground to try and give people a sense of what's happening there. Um, it's a much tougher world now reporting in those conflict zones than it was uh, 30 years ago because now journalists who go in are legitimate targets. You know, Raggy Omar was kicked out um, just a, a few days ago um, from Bahrain because he's seen as a legitimate target by the state. We don't want you here because we're not sure what you're going to stay, say. However, now there are other people who can help mediate that story. Um, <coughs> I don't think that answers your question directly, but I think that space is changing the way established institutional broadcasters do their work. First of all, um, I think the questions from Philip and Georgiana have been very interesting. And Professor Kurt, if I may refer to you as that, your, interest, your answers have also been very thought-provoking. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, sort of a bit of a facetious question, so you can choose to answer or not. You were talking about one should deconstruct. You talked about that a lot at the beginning and find the truth and you know, go out of your way to report. Now, um, what I would ask you is, would you be moving in with Julian Assange in the Equatorial uh, uh, Embassy at the end of the day? Because w I think the question is, are there limits? Are you constrained as such? And I'm not talking about your employees of the BBC, mm. but does it come to a point where a journalist actually has to stop and say, I'm not prepared to go any further. Yeah, I mean, let's take two stories. Um, one reporting on the um, on the unlawful shipment of artifacts out of West Africa, uh, and I did this back in 2000 as a film for BBC. And I found myself on a checkpoint one night, um, faced by a drunken soldier with an AK-47 and a very agitated policeman who clearly hadn't been paid for some time because it was the end of the regime of a butcher. Uh, and suddenly, at one point, there was a gun pointing at my head with the safety catch off, and I was thinking, do I push this any further? Frankly, I decided not to push that any further, so I stepped back. Uh, we still got the story out, but at that particular point, I, I, I uh, stepped back. Let's take another process story, which I've just finished, actually. The fire that killed six people in Camberwell in a tower block. Uh, and the public authorities that were responsible for housing those people and making sure those people were safe in order to get to the bottom of that story, we've had to challenge the fire brigade, we've had to challenge the home office, we've had to challenge um, the local authorities. 
has there at any point been a question that I thought was a legitimate question that I wouldn't ask? No. Any public authority responsible for keeping people safe, as long as it's a legitimate question because they have a legitimate responsibility, is, as far as I'm concerned, fair game. And there was no point in reporting that story where I felt, well, they couldn't. In fact, you know, even at some points, I was straying very close to the edge of what I could say legally. So that's the only constraint, really, is the law. Yeah. And there's no point in me going on and libeling people because then I won't be able to tell the story the following day. But is there any, um, do you feel, I mean, this obviously is in your industry, um, do you feel that you get leaned on a lot in terms of don't go there, Kurt? Yeah, absolutely, all the time. Right. Yeah, you get a phone call and say, oh, we didn't like what you put on last night, so next time we're not going to talk to you. So oh, that's your business, you know. Well, maybe I'll have to report the fact that you don't want to talk to me next time. So with your experience of maturity in, in the industry, you could probably get away with more than the, the young up-and-coming journalists or reporters. Yes, the rule of thumb is you should be more subversive the older you get yes. because you have the license to be yes. more subversive, not become more compliant. Yes. Um, and I think that if you offer a model of uh, being a subversive to young journalists, yes. which is to ask questions, it's not to subvert the True. order and be you all become anarchists, it's to say challenge people. If you, prof if you provide that model that you, as you get more experience, as you become uh, more aware, you become more subversive and you ask tougher questions, that's the way it should be. Perfect, so you fly the flag. Well, I hope so. <laughs> okay, we'll ask questions yeah. from the gentleman in the front. Uh, thanks very much, Kurt. Um, quick question, very simple. Were the Panorama team right to embed um, undercover journalists on a university trip to If they asked the right questions, they were right. I fear they did not ask those LSE students all the right question. The right question should have been, um, we plan to go to North Korea with you, with three journalists, including a camera person, and we intend to film it whilst we're there. That could mean you ending up in the gulag for a very long time. Are you happy with that situation? Answer, yes, film. Answer, no, don't go find some other way of going. There are plenty of other ways of going to North Korea. Um, I think it, you're fine, you know, um, Georgiana asked me, why do people trust you? It's because the output reflects what they've put in and they see it reflected back. I guarantee you there are some of those LSE students who don't feel what they put in was reflected back on screen. And therefore, that journalist may find it difficult to go back to those people and get them to trust him. He may not care. Personally, I care whether those people will trust me. Trust me to have done an uh, honest and um, equitable job. So, no, the BBC should not be in the business of um, telling people half the story to protect them. Because actually, the BBC there was not just playing with its own reputation, it was playing with the reputation of the LSE and playing with the lives of the students. As it happens, it's all turned out okay. But that's not good enough. I think uh, that concludes the last uh, broadcasting today series for this academic year. Thank you very much, Kurt. It's been a real pleasure. I think every student that has been part of this program, Georgiana and myself, we uh, really feel that we've learned a lot. Uh, um, and I think you made a great impact this year. So I would like to finish with a round of applause for Kurt. Thank you. Drinks outside, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank students have been great. Students have made this happen. So, you know, that's the testament to the, uh, to the project.